the greatness of our ancestors and even our present day young people coming out of the black community, out of the Negroic community, of the many contributions, way over 1,800 uh, contributions that have been contributed to society and the com comforts of life. And we want to not just only recognize the late uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And, yeah. and others, but we want, there's many, many others. Yeah. Many others. Yeah. You know, it seems like uh, the mainstream stream, uh, main uh, media streamline, what do you call it, want to just dictate just one or two people, but there are many. Yes. God used those of our ancestors. Amen. And we want to, rec whether they recognize them or not, we as a people want to recognize our great ancestors of African descent. God used those through many prayers. They prayed, they prayed, they prayed, they had faith in God. This is why we're here where we are today. I'm trying to tell you, those old brothers and sisters prayed. Remember my mother telling me how my, my grandfather met the Lord in the woods. He said he knew he had religion after he left. Yeah. See, they was for real. They wasn't no show. Wasn't any show. Yeah. At this time, um, I want the choir to sing. Um, Gonna lay down my burden. Down my yeah.
we want to go into the book to do better research. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I like that whoever brought out Vance Reed, who, who did that? Yes, characters and the one, I think, who did you bring out, Sister Scott? Blake. Blake. Yeah, bring out those. And I want those hung around. I asked for those so that we can be hanged hung around the wall. Yeah. I want those displayed. Yeah. And I want to keep those in a book, an album. Yeah. I want to bind them. Amen. 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 All right. God is on our side. And after that, those with their presentation will come forth and present tonight Amen. their Negroic or black character. In obedience to God, giving double honor to our pastor, to the officers, and to the church, I'm speaking tonight on Granville T. Woods. Granville T. Woods was a black inventor and was born on April the 23rd, 1856 in Columbus, Ohio. He left school when he was 10 years old and went to work to help support his family. Woods became an apprentice to a machinist. He learned blacksmithing, how to invent and repair machines, 
Woods continued his education by attending night school. In 1872, Woods became a fireman on the Danville and Southern Railroad in Missouri. He was later promoted to engineer. After only two years with the railroad, Woods moved to Springfield, Illinois, where he accepted a position in a steel mill. By 1878, he had become an engineer on the Ironsides, a British steamship. Within two years, he had become the ship's chief engineer. In all of the positions that he held, Woods experienced discrimination because of his race. Yes. Unhappy with his inability to obtain higher positions, Woods moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, where he established his own machine shop in 1880. Right. The shop eventually became the Woods Electrical Company. Mm. Woods devoted his energies to developing an improved steam boiler in 1884. Right. He also invented the first electric rail railway that was powered with electric lines from above the train. Right. Previously, the lines had run along the tracks mm -hmm. and had been quite dangerous to pedestrians. Right. Yes. Right. In addition to these inventions, Woods also created the first telegraph service that allowed messages to be sent from moving trains. All right. This invention dramatically improved railroad safety. Yes. Woods also invented several improvements to the air brakes used on locomotives and other large machines. Mm -hmm. Woods sold his inventions to a number of companies, yes. including the American Bell Telephone Company, yes. and as we know, General Electric Company. Yes. By the time of his death, on July the 30th, 1910, Woods had received more than 60 patents. Wow. That's yes. Granville T. Woods, born April the 23rd, 1856, died July the 30th, 1910. My name is Sister Eulis Winbush Burns. Good evening. My name is Sister Edwina Smith, and I would like to present Reverend Harold Moses Anderson. That, may, that name may sound quite familiar to a few of you. He was a filmmaker born in 1922. This reference has to do with Black Wall Street. Black Wall Street was a vibrant black community that was destroyed during race riots that broke out in 1921. Its businesses were burned to the ground and its residents were displaced. Against the odds, Black Wall Street was reborn and by the 1940s was once again a center for black life in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The Reverend Harold Moses Anderson was born in 1922. He grew up hearing about the race riots. He grew up hearing about the stories. And as a young man, he began to take a 16 millimeter camera and go around documenting the resurgence of Black Wall Street. So he was both a witness and he was also a participant in the rebuilding and the revival of this community. A successful businessman, Anderson managed and then owned two movie theaters, a skating rink, bowling alley, shopping strip, among other enterprises. He can be found, his work can be found in the Smithsonian, where he documented between 1948 and 1952 the resurgence of Black Wall Street. And his film and clips can be found there. He was able to document the goings on. With his camera, he documented many Black Wall Street businesses 
including barber shops, bakers, taxi companies, jewelers, and other stores. He also captured its citizens in church, at school, participating in parades, and walking around the area. The film that he conducted includes footage of Richard and Pat Nixon as they campaigned in Black Wall Street, the first vice president candidate to visit this black neighborhood. I present to you tonight, Reverend Harold Moses Anderson. Amen. In obedience to God, to you, Dr. Scott, to all that are here today. <clears throat> I researched and found this person. I thought she was very interesting. Her name is Sadie Tanner Moselle Alexander. Uh, she was born in Janu on, on January the 2nd, 1898. Uh, she was the first African American to receive a PhD in economics in the United Negro, States. Negro American. The first Negro, Negro American? Um, to receive a PhD in economics in the United States in 1921. And the first woman to receive a law degree from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. She, even though she had a doctorate, it was hard for her to practice. And she also wanted to go to law school. So by finding the difficulty to get a professorship in Philadelphia as, an Afro, as a Negro American, even with her doctorate, she decided to take a clerk's job with an insurance company, and she worked there for two years, but she was determined. So later on, she actually did uh, get, get to enroll in the law school in Philadelphia. So she became the very first woman, uh, Negro American woman, admitted in the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Uh, and she, okay, so she and her husband both were active in civil rights law as well. Uh, she died in November, not on November the 1st, 1989, in Andorra, Philadelphia, from pneumonia as a complication from Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this is Sadie Tanner Moselle Alexander, Good evening. In obedience to God, I give honor to you, Pastor Scott, to all who are here. And the Negro and mentor I want to honor tonight is Shelby Davidson. And I chose him because what he invented, I use it every day at work, and that's the paper adding machine, which is this. We got one of those in the Secretary's office. Shelby Davidson was born in Lexington, Kentucky on May 10, 1868. He graduated from Howard University in 1893 with a Bachelor's of Arts degree. Davidson went on to practice law, but it, he is most remembered for being an inventor. Davidson journeyed to Washington, D.C. in 1887, working in, an audit, in the auditing department in the United States Post Office. The young Davidson became interested in finding a more efficient way to handle government adding functions. In 1908, after studying adding machines for two years, Davidson found his answer in the form of his first invention, a rewind device for adding machines. Davidson was convinced his device would greatly improve efficiency by reducing both paper usage and the time clerks spent in paperwork. The government needed to agree with him and officially began utilizing his invention that same year. Davidson would soon take a job with the United States Treasury Department. His performance in these roles was enough to gain him additional promotions, as well as an invention with the Burroughs Adding Company. Shelby's familiarity with these machines was such that he decided to add on to his ad device, one which managed the role of paper that tabulated machines' calculations. This device was called the Paper Rewind Mechanism for Adding Machines. That's that little thing that's attached to the roll where it, it spits out paper, it rewinds it back, he made that. This mechanism allowed the paper to be in review or to be, to be stored. 
It was attached to the adding machine by support arms and also contained an alarm system to alert the user when the paper strip had been broken or was empty. Davidson patented this device on April 14, 1908. In 1911, Davidson also patented this device called the automatic feed device, which Davidson continued to improve. This paved the way for a more efficient processing way of postal fees. That's this machine, I don't know if y'all can see it, but we have this in our office right now. It wow. prints out labels, it's everything we need done, this machine does that for us. Being a United States postal worker myself, I see the fruits of his labor every day, and I thank God for his contribution. So tonight we honor Shelby Davidson, born May 10, 1868, died December 7, 1930. Amen. In obedience to God, double honor to you, Dr. Scott, to the officers, and to everyone here this evening. This one I'm going to speak on tonight uh, sort of stood out to me. I'm not going to talk about an invention, but the creative mind of this person. His name is Henry Box Brown. Henry Box Brown. He was born a slave in Louisa County, Virginia in 1815. Henry was a slave that was motivated to be free because his wife, who was pregnant, and they had three children, were taken from him, and they were sold to another slave owner. This got to Henry so much that he desired to be free. And I mean, this was a strong motivation for him. Henry was also a Christian, and he belonged to the African Baptist Church. Henry also sung in the choir. In 1849, Henry said that God worked in his mind, because it was on him so much to become free, that God worked in his mind how to leave that place from being a slave and go to where freedom was. Right. He built a box. <laughs> he built a box that was three feet long, All right. two feet wide, eight inches deep. He got two people to help him from the church. When he built the box and he got in the box, he got in there with one thing of water, and three biscuits. And whoever helped him wrote on the box, dried goods, this side up. <laughs> they had this box mailed from Virginia to Pennsylvania to the Anti-Slavery Society. And this Anti-Slavery Society was 27 miles away. So Henry, as he traveled in the box, you know, they turned boxes. The mail lady just got to tell me. They turned boxes upside down, any which way, and he was inside the box. He said he was hurting so bad, but he prayed and he endured as that box traveled. So when he finally arrived to his destination in Pennsylvania at the Anti-Slavery Society, when they opened up the box, Henry reached out his hand to shake the gentleman's hand, and he said, how do you do? I waited patiently on the Lord, and he heard my prayer. And he began to sing a hymn. So this was Henry's way of escaping slavery. And he said God gave him this idea. After this experience that Henry had, he, be, he used this very thought that God gave him, and he used this to become an entertainer. So when you see people who are in the entertainment business, and you see somebody pop out of a box, you think of Henry Box Brown, because that's where they got it from. 
Now, Henry's death is not known, but he was born in 1815 in Louisa County, Virginia. And by the way, my name is Sister Alicia Winbush. God of honor to you, Pastor Scott, to the officers of the church, and to everyone here and to those viewing. My name is Sister Elaine Barfield, and I will be speaking on the inventor by the name of Alexander Miles. Alexander Miles was born May 18, 1838, in Duluth, Minnesota. After he was born, he moved from Minnesota to Wisconsin, where he became a barber. But he did not want to stay there. He moved back to his home state of Doolin, got married, had a daughter. After he had a daughter, he decided to continue his barber trade. But then at the same time, he noticed that he did not like the elevator system where he was working. He said, there's a lot of things wrong with the doors in this elevator. I think I might fix this. So not only did he work in a building, but he built his own three-story brick building and called it Miles Block. The bottom of Miles Block was a retail shop, while the top two floors were living spaces. While there, he was influenced by where he worked and he invented the elevator automatic doors. To this day, you may not see a door that you have to open and shut on your own, you now use automatic elevator opening and closing doors. This invention was made in 1887 by Alexander Miles. He died May 7, 1918 in Seattle, Wisconsin. Once again, my inventor is Alexander Miles, the inventor of the automatic elevator doors. We certainly want to thank these presenters tonight. Amen. And I keep on telling you, it's just more than just the late Martin Luther King Jr. Amen. Even though he was a great, he's a great man. I'm not Amen. negating that at all. But there are many, many others that needs to be recognized. Amen. Amen. And, and I just, I tell you, we have so many that uh, history. Now, we're going to, after the 15th of February, then we're going to start with those that are born after 1900. Amen. Start bringing them out. Amen. Amen. All right. At this time, I want to commend those who did a marvelous job tonight. Amen. Yes. Farrell and I, uh, Sister Veronica can come now and uh, do our part two of anger. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. In obedience to God, giving double honor to our pastor, Dr. Scott, to the officer of the officers of the church and to all of you here my brothers and sisters in christ and to those who will be live streaming with us tonight we are tonight covering part two of this very important topic that affects not only people across the world but it affects us right here in the church yeah. anger yeah. anger yeah. tonight we're going to talk about let's trump anger with love right. biblical counseling anger part and above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. 1 Peter 4 and 8. Also, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love.
ahead and read that again. Tonight's topic on anger, this is part two, talking about anger, Trump anger with love, biblical counseling, anger part two. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Taken from 1 Peter 4 and 8. And he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Amen. 1 John 4 and 8. So again, we'll talk about what anger is. Anger is a strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, and hostility. And we have seen plenty of that within the past few months. Anger rages across the United States during the most dramatic pandemic in world history. Americans have never been so sharply divided as a nation, which has led to uh, civil unrest, angry, violent attacks on religious centers and various ethnic groups across the states. In the news recently, some, uh, some man went into, I think, a postal office. So he, could, he shot up four people just because something wasn't right about his package and how people, um, these type of incidences are happening across the country where people are lashing out they're going into institutions, they're going to stores, franchises, and they're either opening fire, they're cussing people out. We can see this anger being played out right here in where we live, and it's happening all around us. Some Christians have joined the protests and movements to voice their frustrations, which is proving to be even more divisive, as well as widening the already heated confrontation. It's not just you. People really are angrier these days. More and more, Americans seem pushed to their limits. They're feuding about politics, protests, and the pandemic. Fights about whether or not to wear a mask are playing out both publicly and in social media. Find that on BangorDailyNews.com. Tensions flare. and some things that have been happening in the country within the past few months. 
um, starting back in March of last year at the beginning of the shutdowns and people are, they, um, they, they've had several statistics saying that there's an increase in domestic violence in homes, uh, people calling in, talking about their partner hit them and it never happened before. So tensions are definitely flaring everywhere. It's not just in one place, it's everywhere. We're gonna talk about anger and the church. It is easy to understand why many Christians have become disenchanted with the American government now. Such things as attacks on and criticism against the church, the replacing of American Christian values with humanism and other social experiments that reject our values has caused Christians to feel deeply angry and in some cases helpless. Shortly after the national shutdown was enforced last March, Churches were specifically targeted by local governments, demanding that all places of worship close their doors, accusing congregations of spreading COVID-19. At the same time, large franchise stores were allowed to stay open, despite the number of employees and store associates testing positive for the virus. This stirred up more anger among Christians, and quite understandably, so we know all this time uh, your, your large franchises, uh, your Costco, your Target, Walmart, these stores have been open. And um, it was just so frustrating how um, the first week of the shutdown, they were arresting pastors, they were fighting churches for worshiping, but then you go right down the street and it seemed like the corner store was open. And when people were standing in front of the corner store, I didn't see anybody harassing them, I didn't see any cops driving up, so it was an obvious discrimination against the church. It was very frustrating and very angry to many Christians. But the path to overcoming anger is through God's love, which enables us to forgive. It's God's love that releases and frees us from anger. So it's a choice. Things happen to us, they cause us to become angry, but we do have a choice how we choose to respond to those things that make us angry. And might I say that the church during this time did not go out with bricks and no. did not, they lawfully took their cases to the courts. That's right. And did it, even though it, very, it upset many of the, including the pastors, my, I was included, uh, when I just got upset because the first place person you want to go to is God. Right. That's the only one can, right. right now, he's the only one can help Amen. the world and this nation yeah. with anger. Yeah. He's the only one. Yeah. If my people who are yeah. called by my name, yeah. it's in Second Chronicles, yeah. what is seven chapter and fourteen verse. Yeah. So, just there's there's a there's an anger that's uncontrollable that causes God to get upset, and there's righteous anger. Right. Yeah. Amen. So, uh, what she's saying is that. Man have this emotion. Yes. It can be stirred either way. Amen. But right now, it's more important to know how to bring a cure, right. not a band-aid to it. Right. Right. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. I'll say that again. It's God's love that actually releases us from anger. This in turn enables us to forgive, allowing us to become rested in heart and mind. Then, love applied becomes biblical counseling in action, which is therapeutic and edifies the church. So God has a way to give us comfort and relief when we turn to him. And you can go to God. Sometimes we don't realize that we should go to God with that angry spirit we have. If we're angered and we're disturbed by what is happening, we should absolutely go to Jesus. The song says, I must tell Jesus. We should tell Jesus how we feel. He's the only one that can soothe us. He's the only one that can give us consolation and confirmation when we see these things happening. There's nothing we can do about the events of the world. 
There's nothing we can do about these situations. They're out of our control, but everything's under God's control. And God has a way to soothe us and give us comfort in this time. So here I am again. Uh, I was listening, I was talking with somebody, some, about the former president, President Trump. They said, I just hate him. I said, how are you going to heaven? You hate people. What, 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 what are you hating him for? I just, I say, you can't, you can't go to heaven like that. You have to love people. Yes. That's true. Amen. Yes. What has he done for you? What is it? Jeez, and I just, I don't want to hear her. I said, okay. And it was so hysterical. And not just only one. I, I just don't talk about it. I don't, I stay away from it because when I see that, I say, okay, I love you. Keep on going. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. You can't go to heaven and hate people. The Bible tells you to pray for them. That's what love does. You go to hell, talking about I can't, and not just only one another. How are you going to go to heaven hating somebody? Just right in your own family, in your own church, in your own home, on your job. I'm, I'm, I love the Lord and you hate your brother. That don't work. It just don't work. You can, you're not going to heaven like that. There's a hot spot for you. And it ain't, it ain't the summertime either. And that's the place you don't want to go. Yeah, that's a, this is a good topic, anger. Uh, the world looks like it's mad. Yes. And it comes from a cold heart. Right. Jesus right. talks about a cold hearted yes. person. Yes. The men's hearts will wax cold. Yes. That means they're angry. Yes. It's in the Bible. Yes. Thank you, sir. And in continuation, you know, we are allowed to become angry. We are allowed to feel yes. anger. God made us in his image. Yes. Anger is one of the things that we feel. Mm -hmm. Just like love, just like, uh, yes. just like confusion. We have a multitude of feelings that we feel, yes. but God made us in his image. There is nothing wrong with feeling anger, okay? Right. We are allowed to become angry from the injustices happening around us yes. and to us because that's how God feels when we sin every day. The injustices we do to one another, it angers God. And so he made us with that mechanism to be angry, to respond in a way of indignation when something wrong is happening. He did put that in us, okay? But a perpetual state of anger leads to wrath. That means Amen. when you're just angry all the time. Amen. So that's when we gotta check it. We shouldn't be angry all the time. We shouldn't wake up angry, go to bed angry, we eat angry, we go to work angry, we go to school angry, we go to the store angry, we're shopping angry, we go to the bathroom angry, we're taking a shower angry. When you're angry all the time, there's something wrong. Amen. That needs to be checked. Because then that leads to wrath, and then that leads to hatred. And then there's nothing Satan won't urge you to do. When we're already to that point where you're feeling that way about somebody, there's nothing you won't do to that person Amen. based on what you feel toward that person. Then, violence. So that video we just saw, that's a lot of anger and hatred and wrath. That comes from Satan. Yeah. God doesn't give us wrath to the point where we hate somebody right. to the point where you go after somebody. We don't get that from our Heavenly Father. Uh -huh. We get that from the other guy. <laughs> However, the love of God is the most powerful agent in the world. Yes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God's love is powerful. And when God's biblical love is put in action through charity, even anger caused by the deepest hurt can be quelled. That's right. So this happened about almost five years ago. I don't know if anyone remembers. Um, a young Caucasian man went into a black church 
in South Carolina, Charleston, South, South Carolina. Yeah. They opened their doors to him. Yeah. They allowed him to attend Bible class with them. Right. They didn't uh, put any restrictions on him. They didn't make him feel any kind of way because he wasn't black. They, they welcomed him, yeah. basically. And toward the end of the service, that young man stood up and he opened fire yeah. on the congregants. He killed nine of them. Yeah. He didn't just shoot them once. He shot them several times. Yeah. But here's the response of the church and of the families who were affected directly by what this man, by what this young Caucasian boy did coming into their church and what they did. Look at their response. It's not saying that they're not angry, that they weren't hurt, but look at how the love of God was in action in this story. Yeah. I was very touched by it years ago when I saw a grieving Negro parishioner of Emmanuel AME Church in South Carolina demonstrate forgiveness towards Caucasian youth who murdered their loved ones at a Wednesday night Bible study. Yes. This was very horrendous. Latest in the massacre at the Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina overnight. A packed vigil, thousands of people you can see them locking arms, hear them singing those songs and remembering the nine people that were shot dead inside that church. All of this after a very dramatic and moving, powerful courtroom confrontation between the families of the victims and the young suspect, Dylan Rue, with ABC, Steve and Sami, beginning our coverage in Charleston this morning. Good morning, Steve. Good morning to you, Paul. I have to tell you, I'm still struck by something we're seeing this morning, days after the killings here. People are still marching up with flowers in their hands and grief on their faces to pay their respects to the, to the people who were killed here. And, and these are people of all ages and all colors. The police have set up a barricade to make more room for them in the street. Authorities are also telling us this morning that the 21-year-old they have in custody who reportedly wanted to start a race war is confessing to the murders here. At 21-year-old Dylan Roof's first court appearance, a judge decided to keep him locked up with a million-dollar bond. The charge of nine counts of murder and one count of possession of a weapon during the commission of a violent crime. While off camera, the families of the nine people he's accused of murdering at a Bible study were speaking out with surprising compassion for Roof. He could hear their every word, the daughter of Ethel Lance speaking to him directly. I will never talk to her. Ever again, I will never be able to hold her again, but I forgive you. The mother of Tawanta Sanders shed tears as she spoke. Police say Ruth meant to kill African Americans. We welcome you Wednesday night at our Bible study with open arms. You have killed some of the most beautiful people that I know. Every fiber in my body hurts and I'll never be the same. But the sister of Reverend DePayne Middleton says she's struggling. To me, I'm a work in progress, and I acknowledge that I am very angry. But one thing DePayne has always joined in in our family with is that she taught me that we are the family that love built. We have no room for hate. So we have to forgive. I pray God on your soul. Her cousin, also a Reverend, tells us she's grieving badly. She was my big cousin, she was my big sister, and everything she did, I wanted to do it too. A near capacity crowd came to this college basketball arena for a vigil. We're loving if you will think about the nine names. Praying for the dead Friday night. If that young man thought he was going to divide this community or divide this country with his racial hatred, we are here today and all across America resoundingly say he miserably failed. The families here are still waiting for the medical examiner to finish his process and release them the bodies so that they can begin the plant funerals. Damn. Steve, thank you. What the mayor said about the failure to divide that community, very powerful. Steve Ozasami, thank you once again. Me. So just to show what was done to them was very horrendous. But just to hear the family's response, one of them said, I forgive you. So it's possible. I don't, you know, I don't understand all these people out in the streets protesting saying, I can't forgive and we won't forget. These people had their loved ones taken from them. And the following week, they told that young man, we forgive you. So God is able to help us. He's able to help us overcome anger, even when it hurts. This close to you, when it's this bad, there's nothing God can't help us with. Two reasons 
Two reasons to let go of anger and forgive. Any radical movement or revolution without accountability is just anarchy and doesn't produce positive results or benefit humanity as a whole. But that's the great thing about God's word. The scriptures always lead us to self-reflection and to take responsibility for our actions, as well as how we choose to respond when we do get angry. And as you would that man should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Amen. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. St. Luke 6 and 31. This leads us to understand the important role of forgiveness to help avoid being consumed with anger. Yes. Forgiveness and love applied benefits everybody involved. Amen. One, forgiveness is actually for the individual who needs to forgive. Forgiveness improves our own health and our own conscience. Amen. Pastor Robert Jeffers said, anger and an unforgiving spirit is like acid in a container. It is the container that becomes damaged by the acid over time. The individual who won't forgive becomes damaged by their unwillingness to do so. Amen. And so last week we talked about the effects of anger, the effects of long-term anger on your actual physical body and your health. It affects us detrimentally. When we are angry all the time. It breaks our body down. So literally, anger, having built up anger, keeping angry, being angry instead of letting God help you, instead of letting God come in and help us to forgive, it damages us, and it damages our relationships. Two, most importantly, you know what? We anger God every day when we break and neglect to keep his commandments. And we must realize that God conditions his forgiveness of us on our ability to actually forgive one another. The Lord tells us that if we don't forgive one another's trespasses, our Heavenly Father won't forgive us of ours. Amen. St. Matthew 6 and 15. So we have to forgive. Amen. And we can forgive. Yes. Love works. Mm -hmm. Trust the process. We believe in law and order. These are the words of Dr. King. We are not advocating violence. We want to love our enemies. Those are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. If I am stopped, our work will not stop, for what we are doing is right. Love applied is right. Forgiving is right. And he said this back in 1956 in Montgomery, Alabama. Anger stalls progress. History does prove this. History teaches us that revolutions and movements driven by anger tend to be short-lived as well as reinforce the tensions that cause them, yielding minimal or no advancement towards helping the cause. What we've also learned is that actions promoted by love, following the nonviolent approach defined in the Holy Bible, demonstrated by Jesus Christ, has always been effective and brings people together. God's word works. Yeah. He tells us to love our enemies, pray for those who despitefully use us. God's way always works. Yeah. We can overcome, again. One of the greatest instances of love, trumping hate in history, was the culmination of the civil rights movement in 1963. A Baptist Negro preacher in the person of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. led a peaceful march of both Negro and Caucasian, Christian, Catholic, Jewish, young and old Americans to the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. It was there that Dr. King delivered his soul-stirring I Have a Dream speech to over 250,000 Americans who for that brief moment in American history had all things common and were united under Christian values of equality for all God's children. So it can't be done. Forgiveness can't be done. Let's overcome anger through prayer and fasting together. There is renewed power through prayer and fasting because we are reminded that ultimately we are dependent on God. Amen. Prayer and fasting humbles us. Amen. This comes from a topic or an article in the Washington, in the, Huff, in the Huff Post. Yes, tensions are high in this country due to the recent events and the divisive climate is causing people everywhere to actually very become angry, even Christians. But we are not helpless in this spiritual warfare against wickedness, and we certainly don't have to succumb to this angry climate saturating our country. Amen. We have power 
through prayer and fasting yes. because God is the source of our strength. Yes. His spirit enables us to forgive, yes. to show love and action, even in the face of wrongdoing and global transition and the anger this causes us to feel. So we can overcome anger through the love of Christ, through forgiveness. God will help us do that. And these things do come by prayer and fasting. Yes. So, and Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Yeah. St. Matthew 17, 20 through 21. And that concludes tonight's part two on anger. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any comments or questions regarding what we've covered tonight? The topic anger, part two. Deacon Smith. Uh, it'll be Scott, I don't want to try to pass to Dr. Scott. And to you, uh, Sister Veronica, I thank God for this uh, lesson. Uh, as I was looking at this, uh, it shows me the importance of having Christ in my life. Amen. Because there are many things that goes on in life can make you angry. But without Christ, it goes, that anger goes in the wrong direction. Amen. Which can cause further damage. Yes. But with Christ, he gives us, it's the love that he has put in us that give us that ability to control that anger and direct it in a positive way. And to hear the ladies and whose husband and family was killed say, I forgive. That's God. That's, that is, uh, that's that godly love that he instills in us. Yes. So I'm just grateful to God that I'm a Christian. Amen. So when the situation comes that is out of my control uh, from a human standpoint, Christ steps in and helps me to deal with it. So I thank God for this lesson. Amen. 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 Sister Relay. In obedience to God, I've honored the past of God to the offers of the church, just facilitating everyone here. I thank God for how he opens up this opportunity to learn more about how to deal with our own self and about the fact that we have emotions and that there is a right way to deal with our emotions and not to just have outbursts and meltdowns, but to go to God in prayer. Because in prayer and fasting, fasting and praying, God helps us to deal with ourselves. So I thank God for being with counsel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll turn it back into the hands of our counsel. Yeah. Sister Facilitator did a marvelous job in this yeah. and she is bringing out relative uh, uh, events on anger, yeah. which we all do have. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Uh, just speaking on that. I grew up in an area, in, in an atmosphere, what they call ghetto lifestyle. Even though my parents were not ghetto, but we were poor. Yeah. We weren't poor, we were poor. P-O. And in my neighborhood, uh, it's amazing how, and I, I'm thankful to God that I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. Quote. And I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna criticize anybody who has, but I learned, I learned how to struggle to get what I wanted. And the atmosphere that, and the atmosphere that I grew up in you had to fight mm -hmm. All right. to stay outside. Yes. You had to prove yourself that you were not a, well at that time they called it sissy. You, you were not afraid to go uh, knuckle knuckle. You know, and the school that I went to, you had to prove yourself yes. as a ninth grader, 
uh, we had elevators at our school and, and the area where I was, it was rough. Where I got on and they say, you gonna pay dues. I say, not today. <laughs> and, and not the, so you had to prove yourself. Now, what am I saying? That anger caused a lot of those that I grew up with to do unsavory things. Yes. To get killed, to uh, go to prison, to have a short life. And I, I know this for a fact. One thing that I give my mother and my parents credit for, they kept me in church. Yeah. <laughs> they kept me in church. Even though when I was a little boy, I hated church. But when I met the Lord, that changed my life. But one thing that held me from doing what some of the others we're doing in the community and was that others, the Holy Spirit yes. Yes. kept me yes. and kept my anger. I used to have a, a very bad anger, uh, uh, real, I say real quick temper, but God calmed that down. I thank God for putting me under the past Anderson. Yes. I think God, yes, it really cools me down. To say a few words on this lesson tonight from Hebrews, the 13th chapter, and verse, uh, let me get my other glasses. Marriage is honorable yeah. Yeah. in all, and the bed undefiled. But whore mongers and adulterers, God will judge. Yeah. Now that's just as plain as the nose is on your face. Yeah. Stop whoring. Yeah. You're going to hell. Right. God's going to judge. Yeah. He talks about that in Revelation. All liars and whoremongers yeah. shall have their part in the lake. Let your conversation, now this is what I want to emphasize tonight, be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. This tells us that whatever you need, you don't have to be envious about somebody else's fortune. Some think that somebody else's fortune is their misfortune and all you need to do is exchange your attitude drop your cane attitude and pick up an able attitude give your best and God will satisfy your mind with whatever you he says delight yourself in the Lord. So he's saying here, don't be covetous. Yes. Covetous is dangerous. Yes. One man, one preacher told me, I want those shoes you got on. I say, they make them at the store. <laughs> this is not the only pair they made. Right. No, but I want those. Right. Now that's bad. Right. Right. When you just want what, in other words, you telling you really telling on yourself that you're envious against that person. Right. Yes. 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 That's what you're really saying. Yes. Right. 
that you are jealous of that person. Anytime somebody says, I can do that better than you, what are you saying? You're not content with what God has given you. And that leads to bad results. Now, the Lord have said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I'm more than the world. If I'm for you, I'm more than the world against you. So, what do you have to lose? Nothing. With God, you don't lose anything. When you're out there grumbling and looking around and seeing what you don't have and you wish you had that, you don't have that, you want to go there need that man and you want that woman and you just <laughs> hold yourself yeah. Miss Vashti <laughs> Mr. Kane look what God has blessed you with right. and you're still not satisfied even if you had what you wanted you still wouldn't be satisfied And the Lord said, I, have, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Good. Greek, what more do you want? You got the Almighty God? He said, He'll never leave you, nor forsake you. When all the mother brothers forsook you, all the mother sisters forsook you, and you got God. Talk down, Lord, I'm going to say something in the world. <laughs> what they say, you got to be crazy. <laughs> when God is with you, yes. what yes. more do you want? Right. Right. You know what it is? You're not satisfied because you're not praying right. right. You're not letting him have your mind. Right. You're not giving him your heart. Yeah. You're not striving to please him. If you please him, he'll make you, he'll give you the desires of your heart. He's already said that. He said, I'll never leave you, nor to say you. Well, it's just a beautiful thing to know that God, now, he left Saul. <laughs> Good grief. That's something to think about. That's 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 shuddering time. When God leave a man, woman. That that that's ooh. He prayed, could get no answer from nobody. He had to. He did something that was unrighteous anyway. Went to a witch. Yeah. Right. Bible says a witch shouldn't even live. Right. That's what the Bible says. Yeah. Called him back to family and said, what, what are you disturbing me from my from my rest? Yeah. He asked him, what's gonna happen? He said, You'll be with me tomorrow. Yeah. In other words, he'd be dead. Yeah. The Lord, Israel thought they were God's pet until Israel was ransacked, was conquered, was taken over, the walls were torn down in 586 B.C. They just, the temple of the Lord, are now we, God with us. You can't do in and everything thinking God going to be with you. You talk, you going to go against God's will when you think he going to be with you? <laughs> it's not going to happen. I don't care what you say. Read in the Bible. There's some say God was with them and got killed. Your heart. God sees our heart. You know what? Yes. 
Yes, it does. Anytime you have an evil thought, right there and then they say, oh, Lord, forgive me for you. Repent right there. Get, get it straight. Amen. Don't let that pass. Amen. Amen. We can thoughts, evil thoughts, and we can imagination. You might not say a word. Sister, uh, um, running for his life, he and his daughters. Sister Lot, never said a word. But uh, ways and actions spoke louder than words. Some people don't have to say a word. You can tell by the way they act. What they're saying. That's why my late pastor said, I, I like, and I'm, I'm like him, I'm a, I like to see how, what you're looking like when I'm talking to you. Yeah. Your expression. You can't, ex yeah. you can't change your expression. Yeah. You may go hide and juggle, but I got it. I got it. Caught it. <laughs> Some people, that my, my ass, nice, nasty attitude. Yeah. Yeah. I caught it. And don't you know God got it too? Yeah. Don't you know he... he <laughs> you pushing them away. Some never come by my office and missing some of the greatest blessings. <laughs> Don't say, hey, how you doing? Man? That's all right, too. Because I'm not going to run after you. <laughs> God don't run off. You know what? God don't run after He don't run after you. He didn't run after that rich young woman. The Bible says he loved him. But he, he didn't run after him. No. There's a line that, uh, let me just say it, and Lord, help me. God just don't cross. We got to do this. There's a line where he, sets up the parameters yes. and the process yes. to come to him through Christ. Yes. And he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Yes. But we got to follow the process. Yes. That prayer and fasting yes. is essential. Yes. Obedience is the highest order of belief. It's amazing how we, we want God to come down to our level. We have to measure up to his level. I press, the great apostle said, toward the mark of the higher calling of God in Christ. I, I press, I haven't made it yet. If the great apostle Paul said that one of them, he was second to Jesus. And he said he pressed. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. I press. Yes. You'd be surprised how uh, the word is sharper than a two-edged sword. Yes, yes, it is. Oh, yeah. I'll be your friend. I'm your friend. I'll be your friend. I won't harm you. I'll pray for you. But when you make decisions against that Bible, you walking by yourself. I'm not going to deviate from the word. I don't care who, who's with you. I know who's with me. He said he'll never leave me nor forsake me. Who would give me a vision, a dream, and show me uh, going down, and then I wake up, and then I get a call, and then it's, and I, and it's the wrong, the wrong uh, uh, price, and he lets me know. Yes. And you mean to tell me I'm going to listen to you? <laughs> Jehovah, 
the Bible said Jehoshaphat was a righteous king. But he was in the wrong company. You can be talking holy. Here you can be thinking holy, but with you with the wrong people, and you running with the wrong trouble, trouble gonna overrun you too. So this Bible. The Lord means what he says. Yes. He don't change his word. Right. He says, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. Amen. Now, I can't run. I can't, I used to run. This young man, he's going to be a the Lord is blessing him. Amen. I can't run like I like him anymore. <laughs> I can't. I'm blessed to be walking. <laughs> Struggling at that. I used to have what they call curls in my hair. Black curly hair. They call it silver now. You know the Long Ranger's horse? High your silver? Time brings on the change. Amen. I used to wear a size 26. But I'm not going to tell you what size I wear now. Time brings on a change. But you know one thing doing all these changes? God has never left me. I'm a Jesus of that.